So in part two here, we'll continue with Dehane's uh, research into the brain correlates of consciousness. And you'll recall he used a masking procedure where you present a word and then a mask follows within a critical time window. And uh, what you can do is uh, arrange this, uh, the mask and its precise timing so that half the time the subject consciously sees the word tree and half the time not. Notice that in both conditions, though, the subject is seeing the same visual stimulus. The difference is that sometimes they're conscious of the word, sometimes not. And that uh, is an ideal experimental setup to look for uh, patterns of brain activity that are different for the conscious perception uh, from the mask. Uh, condition. And we said that uh, when we consciously see the word tree, there is widespread activity in the frontal cortex and parietal cortex, and that is not uh, present when the word is masked and the person is not aware of the word. But notice there is uh, visual cortex activity here, so this early stage of visual processing is happening unconsciously, and this activity has to spread to frontal cortex and parietal cortex for us to uh, be conscious of the stimulus. Now when you play around with the timing of the, of the word tree and the mask, um, you, you find some intuitively uh, understandable results that uh, if we think about sort of the, the word tree as being pr uh, is making its way along the visual cortex uh, pathway for recognition, um, the longer the delay between the stimulus and the mask, the more it is allowed to progress and the more it's allowed to set up those reverberating loops and then spread that activity to uh, frontal cortex and parietal cortex. So the longer the delay, the more likely the word will enter into consciousness. You've given the visual system more time to process and set up these uh, patterns of uh, reverberating loops sufficient to uh, spread that activity to other areas of the brain. Now when you do the uh, scalp recording of electrical activity on the surface of the cortex, um, a very common finding is, is that when subjects consciously report a stimulus, like the word tree on the screen, there is this large wave of activity called the P300 because it appears at about 300 milliseconds after the presentation of the word tree. And this is, uh, can be recorded over several brain areas. Uh, it's very prominent in the frontal part of the frontal cortex. Uh, and this P300 wave, Dehane argues, is a correlate of a conscious perception of the word tree. Interestingly, um, it is uh, fairly late, right? 300 milliseconds, and recall that a lot of that early visual processing is, is happening then unconsciously, but it's this, this shift, this trigger, this spreading of activation that the P300 seems to be recording. Now, uh, that transition is kind of an all or none uh, transition. It either makes it into consciousness or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, there is still a P300 uh, signature, but it is a much smaller uh, um, uh, signal, and it decays much more quickly. So for the masked condition, a visual processing occurs, but the spreading activation does not. And so the P300 signal is much smaller, and it decays quickly. If the spreading does happen, that kind of all or none spreading, the tree stimulus has made it to the frontal cortex, and then you can get larger reverberating loops set up, you get that large P300 uh, wave. So now in this diagram, we'll see what Dehane means here by this kind of uh, uh, all or none shift. Um, so he argues that in the early stages of visual processing, uh, all of that processing is happening unconsciously and in parallel. In fact, there are different dedicated areas of visual cortex that seem to be sort of processing different aspects of visual information. The shape of something, the color, the motion, etc. Well, the subject saw the word tree on the uh, computer screen, so different parallel visual pathways are operating on that visual stimulus. However, if uh, there's no mask present, that information can reach those frontal cortex systems. That's when we get the emergence then of conscious awareness of the of the stimulation. And he, he argues that, that in a sense the modularity that is typical of the early um, sensory processing and perceptual process is going to be broken with the emergence of consciousness. Because what's going to happen is the frontal cortex systems, 
are going to now be able to share that information back to the other perceptual areas uh, and other parts of the brain uh, to, in a sense, broadcast what it is that has achieved consciousness. And so uh, here's a quote from him. Access to consciousness corresponds to the ignition of distributed workspace neurons. Now he's going to call these neurons in the frontal cortex part of a global workspace. So it's the ignition of distributed workspace neurons, particularly dense and prefrontal parietal cortices whose long distance axons dispatch information to distant processors. So let's take a, a different look at what that would mean. So again, the subject sees the word tree, and if there's, uh, there might be a mask, but it, it is adjusted so that on that particular trial, they happen to become conscious of the word tree. The tree now here, we're going to represent it in our working memory box, right? And what uh, Dehane and others, uh, Bernard Bars and others, argue is that we can think of consciousness as involving this global workspace. He says, what we mean by being conscious of a certain piece of information is that it has reached a level of processing in the brain where it can be shared. Notice we have arrows going back. These would be long-distance axons. And so the tree now has, has made it up to this system in, in such a way that now that information can be broadcast to other specialized processors in the brain. Right? Um, here's another quote. What we subjectively experience as consciousness is the global availability of information, which allows it to be reported to us and to others. For example, uh, some of the communication uh, of, of the word tree it involves the language uh, system here. So the, the visual stimulus tree, the word tree, is up in our working memory, and now we can activate the sound of the word tree, and then the motor program to say the word tree. We can access the meaning of, of the word tree tree. We can uh, try to remember the word tree, right? The hippocampal system is online here, can now remember that we saw the word tree. Maybe if the word tree disappears, we can maintain the image of the word tree in visual imagery by activating visual cortex, etc. We can maintain our attention to the word tree. So the global workspace idea is this suggestion that that once uh, a stimulus enters into this system, it is now uh, capable of being shared. In other words, other systems have access to that, right? So this information here in the global workspace is available for other brain systems to do further processing. Now, once a stimulus enters the global workspace, then this communication with other areas of the brain sets up a, a kind of co-activation, correlated activity in these other areas. And we can think of this as uh, in the following way. Once the stimulus has achieved consciousness, the cortical regions that process different aspects of the tree stimulus synchronize their activity, producing a single mental content. Now, the, he uses this idea of synchronizing activity, uh, but remember, let's not confuse that with that synchrony that we saw in the research on sleep and anesthetic drugs. Recall that that kind of cortical synchrony uh, abolishes consciousness. Dehane's use of the word here means that uh, once this information is being shared, other areas of the brain are being activated uh, uh, simultaneously and all are processing this, the same information in their own unique ways. So the visual form of the word tree is activating a pattern of uh, brain cells down here uh, that would correspond to the sound of the word, but the visual form of the word tree is, is activating a different pattern of brain cells over in this region of cortex, which is ac accessing meaning, etc. But they're all processing the same uh, uh, information in a sense. It's all related to the thing that entered into consciousness. And so that's what he means by uh, synchrony. And so then what you have then is this global broadcast of information sets up a mode of brain processing that is uh, centered around this stimulus that is conscious. Now that ends up producing then this single mental content. If another word comes up on the screen that we consciously see, then the whole pattern of broadcasting will change. A new word will enter the working memory system and activate uh, uh, slightly different neural circuits in those same areas uh, that corresponds to information about a different word. So, for example, if the, the word boat is the next word that we're conscious of, well, now we're conscious of boat. We're no longer conscious of the word tree. Uh, we see the word boat, and so a different set of loop being neural communications will be set up uh, corresponding to the conscious awareness of a different word.
Now let's uh, just change the paradigm a little bit. Suppose uh, we're instructed to simply reflect on a word that we see pop up on the computer screen. So let's say tree comes up here. And so that's a time one in our working memory system. So right, all that kind of spreading activation has entered uh, the word tree into our working memory system, this global workspace, right? Uh, and uh, recall then that that information can be shared. Now let's focus on just the long-term memory store. So now we have a situation where the, the word tree may be activating different kinds of memories that are related to the tree. We might have a, an episodic memory, an autobiographical memory of climbing a favorite tree. Maybe we uh, uh, know some world knowledge that uh, in the old days uh, that when a cat would get stuck in a tree, the fire department would come out, come out and rescue the cat. So maybe that kind of th thought could be activated. Maybe we've got semantic uh, information or other world knowledge that trees perform photosynthesis. And we can think of these different uh, memories here as being engaged in a competition, right? So this stimulus here in our working memory being broadcast to our long-term memory system is going to be fishing for related uh, uh, memories. Well, it turns out that the autobiographical memory wins the competition and that's then the next thing that enters our working memory. Well, what we consciously experience though is a word tree We've got the goal in mind to reflect. That's what the experimental told us. But we see the word tree, and then the next thing that comes to mind is this recollection, right, of a memory involving climbing a tree. What we, again, uh, aren't, uh, we don't have introspective access to is this competition. What we may not sort of realize, right, it's beyond our uh, consciousness, is that there might have been several different uh, memories being activated here, but. Um, uh, but one of them wins that competition, and that's the one we experience as the next uh, conscious thought. So for, for Dehaene, we can ask a, a question, well, what is consciousness good for? And he makes the following points. Well, unconscious information fades quickly. We saw that uh, in, the, uh, in the experiments uh, where uh, you don't get that spreading activity. So there can be some uh, activity uh, happening in the visual cortex there, but it doesn't spread to the frontal cortex and parietal systems. Um, nevertheless, that unconscious information can still influence uh, uh, processes in the brain, and we'll see other research that uh, lends support to that. Um, what's consciousness good for? Well, conscious information can be held in working memory. Now, we might flip that, that around and say that which can be held in working memory can achieve consciousness. And see here again, Dehaene and others are going to argue there's this overlap in our, in our sort of the, these concepts of working memory and consciousness. And in fact, attention is also intimately related with these. What we're uh, focusing attention on is more likely to enter working memory and, and achieve consciousness, right? Uh, so attention, consciousness, working memory are all very intimately related. As to the function of consciousness, um, and we might also uh, suggest it's a function of the working memory system, to provide an internal workspace to perform thought experiments, in a sense, while we can be detached from the external world. Here's a more extended quote from Dehaene. The main function of consciousness is to provide an internal space where you can perform thought experiments, as it were, in an isolated way, detached from the external world. You can select a stimulus that comes from the outside world and then lock it into, ins into this internal global workspace. You may stop inputs from getting in and play with this mental representation in your mind for as long as you wish. So for Dehaene, it is useful to have a system uh, in the brain that can take the results of uh, individualized processors in other parts of the brain, put them in a format where they can be shared to other parallel processors so that other useful work can be done. It's just that what we experience when that sharing is happening, when that broadcast is happening, we experience a conscious experience. Now that may leave some a little uh, unsatisfied because it still raises a profound puzzle. Why is it that just because a certain stimulus has has made its way towards these frontal cortex circuits and then spread to the parietal cortex, why does that have this feel of being conscious? And whereas if uh, the activity is restricted to the uh, visual uh, system, why that is not conscious? After all, it's all just neurons, right? There are neurons here in the visual cortex. There's neurons up here in the frontal cortex. Uh, th they all kind of operate in the same principles, action potentials and squirting a little uh, neurotransmitters out of terminal why is it that, that this 
pattern of activity, this global pattern of sh broadcasting information, sharing it with other regions, why that is, uh, is a very different type of thing. It's a conscious experience as opposed to all the unconscious processing going on at localized regions. That is still sort of intuitively uh, deeply mysterious.